this conversation. Um, thematically, uh, reverence, memory, and process. Um, and those are very powerful things in, in one's lives and also very important in one's process and experience as an artist. And uh, you've really honed in on that and, and have really uh, uh, are living through it, which is quite nice. And it's actually coming through in the work. It's not uh, manufactured, let's just say. So we appreciate that. Thank you, brother. So, given it means that a lot just, coming from you, man. Given that we were just talking about Asia, right? And Asia is uh -huh. so important. And, and you and I have had talks about Istanbul and, and we've both been there. And, and again, it's proximity. Of course, it's, it's, it's really the, the crossroads of the world because it connects to Asia. Um, and of course, uh, Islam and Catholicism and all that that's come through there. Um, you you uh, visited Istanbul and you've produced some really beautiful work. Um, what we, well, first of all, let's talk about your experience there in Istanbul. Sure. Um, so I actually started going to Istanbul in 99 because I was on a trip to London with some friends and we decided to just go there on a whim for vacation, like for a few days. And I absolutely fell in love with it um, for the reasons that you just mentioned. It's, you know, this incredible place with this, um, you know, entrance to Asia. It's you're on the cusp of European and Asian culture. Uh, and, you know, it was once the capital of Rome, Constantinople. It's just this really interesting, dynamic place. And um, right away, I connected to all the calligraphy that you saw in the mosques and in the museums. And, um, you know, it would be some years before I returned, but I was invited to go back uh, for the Istanbul Arts and Culture Festival hosted by Istanbul 74, where I was able to do an exhibition. And uh, also, again, experiment with some of the local cultures uh, of ceramic there, which is what you're looking at here, um, which was part of a show that I did there called Isthmus. Um, the title Isthmus is just really simple and interesting. Uh, it's an Isthmus is a piece of land surrounded by uh, three parts of water, almost like a peninsula, but its significance is that it connects two larger bodies, um, continental bodies, and that's Europe and Asia. And so I wanted to take it further and connect my culture of being a writer, which was born in, let's say it was born in New York and Philadelphia, and then it expanded throughout the United States first before it hit the world, right? So it's a kind of westernized culture to be a writer, to be part of this like hip hop diversity that, that we have born and created. And I wanted to bridge it with ancient uh, work, like some of the artwork that, that I was seeing at a, at a place that I visited there called the Sakip Sabanchi Museum. And the museum has one of the oldest, if not the oldest and most important collection of Arabic calligraphy in books and sketchbooks and in ceramics. So um, with, with their blessing, I was able to study a lot of their works and spend time at the museum and then react to some of those works by, you know, making ceramics like the ones that you're seeing here and paintings. And so the exhibition was really a huge bridge and homage to connect the East and the West thematically, um, maybe even in my mind, like a peace offering, like a, a, a way to, 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 during this very crazy turbulent time in the United States of having, you know, the politics being upside down, it was showing a different face of an American, right? Because out there when you travel in the world, you know, people always ask me like where I'm from and, you know, as instinctual as it is, I always say I'm Cuban, but the fact is I'm Cuban American and I'm also from here just as much as I am from the Caribbean. So I wanted to pay, you know, homage to both cultures and Istanbul seemed like the perfect place to do it. It was an invitation also uh, as a parallel project of the Istanbul Biennial. So there was a great platform of artists from all over the world. And it was just a great opportunity to continue the expansion of who we are. Right. It, it also puts you in a role as an ambassador, uh, which, is, which is really important. I think that's what's really appreciated, that you want not just represent the U.S., you're representing, like you said, Caribbean culture. And that, that isn't very common in 
let's just say, in the contemporary art space, uh, and uh, especially uh, with graffiti writers, so to speak. Um, yeah. One, one of the things uh, as we move forward, I, I do want to talk to you about this project, uh, the Segmented Realities, uh, yeah. which is interesting coming off of the, the, the Istanbul, you know, do, you, once you start making your work tactile, right? And then you start mm. considering it in the round as sculpture, as objects, uh, as, as concrete ideas, let's, let's just say. Yeah. Um, and so tell me, this is at the High, High Museum. Tell us about this project. Sure. Were, were, sure. were, these, were, were these, the fir these the first standalone sculptures that you attempted? Yes, yes. So this was a project titled Segmented Realities. I was uh, invited by Michael Rooks, who's the curator at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, to do um, a, a project that involved a larger project, which was titled Imagining New Worlds, which was a huge honor for me because it included the most known painter, Wifredo Lam, who um, is one of the original surrealist painters, just an incredible artist and a local painter that I admire very much named Fahamu Peku, um, who is a local African-American artist uh, based in Atlanta and myself. Uh, we each had our own part of the museum and uh, I titled, my show segmented realities because each, whether it was a sculpture, a standalone sculpture uh, or sculptural painting or one of the paintings, each one was about a place. Um, uh, concurrently, it was 2015 that marked the 25th anniversary of the falling of the Berlin Wall. At the same time, uh, President Barack Obama had just announced that Cuba and the United States for the first time in over 60 years would have uh, legitimate conversations, official conversations. And, you know, I started to reflect back on what it felt like to me as a Cuban American to, to hear that the Berlin Wall was falling and that the Iron Curtain was coming down, right? For me, it was like, wow, that's really intriguing because it was the fall of the Soviet Union which sparked tremendous poverty in Cuba, uh, a period known as Periodo Especial, which is a special period. Yep. Um, Wifredo Lam, as an artist, was someone that, you know, was representative of not only Cuban culture by traveling in Europe. He lived in Italy, in Spain, in Paris, and painted, and was part of one of the most uh, important art movements of the 20th century. He was also Afro-Cuban. He was also Chinese-Cuban. So he was Afro-Asian and Caribbean at the same time. And he was hanging out with the best painters of, of his era. So all of these things started to really come together for me. And I wanted to expand on the vernacular of my paintings that were based on walls and make actual walls. And uh, so like the ones that we're looking at here, one of them is uh, a street called um, uh, Amalcipeta in Istanbul. Then in, you have Harlem, uh, uh, what is it? Um, 106th Street and Park Avenue, which is the address of the Hall of Fame in Harlem. You have Savannah, Georgia. You have, um, Wake, you have White Plains Road and, yeah, White Plains Road and uh, 246th Street in the Bronx. So each, actual painting uh, or sculptural painting is an homage to a location, to a place. Do you, was, do you embed the personality of the location into the work? Yeah, the colors are, are basically samples. The way that you would sample a record to make a new record, I was sampling the colors from walls around the globe, like by taking photographs and remixing the colors to use those existing colors, like let's say in Harlem, or in Miami and remaking it for that sculpture. But at the same time, I was collecting posters every time I traveled, like broken advertisements and posters from around walls and cities everywhere. I would collect them, bring them back to my studio and reapply them. Here, we're looking at a extension of that exhibition that traveled to the um, SCAD Museum of Art. And you can see in the background, there's a piece of the ghetto piece from the earlier part of our conversation. Yes. So I was about resampling some of my own history and time and making sort of a time capsule out of one of the sculptures. 
Yeah, it's fascinating because the, the, I think many of us who are attracted to your work, uh, has, it's in our memory. I know for me, particularly, you know, in being in the South Bronx and, you know, in Harlem and New York, that these textures and these colors mean something, uh, you know, and, and they, they're, they actually trigger, aren't they? They're triggers for people. They're emotive triggers that pull us back into these, these places. I hope so. I mean, some people, you know, have said, oh, they're like massive tombstones. Some people say, you know, this reminds me of a place that I used to live. You know, a lot of people in Cuba also resonated with these because they were also part of, um, I did a separate project during the Havana Biennial in 2015. After these, I took new ones to Cuba and I showed them outdoors alongside the Malecon, which for those of you that don't know uh, Cuba, the Malecon is the sea wall um, that is basically on the edge of Havana and the Caribbean Atlantic facing the north, you know, facing Keys, the, the Florida Keys in Miami. And so they, they really had this ominous feeling there because they were like, you know, chunks of places from around the world suddenly like now, you know, in a way juxtaposed with Havana's barren falling, you know, deteriorated walls also. Yeah, but uh, one of the nice things about Havana, it mm. is, it, it's vibrant still. D despite, despite its decay, there's the, the vibrancy of the, the Caribbean painting, the colors of the, the, the buildings and the cars and the people. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, Cuba has patina, you know? It, it's like more, <laughs> more than a lot of places. I mean, like, you know, I've been to other places, you know, that have also a lot of patina. But I got to say, you know, Cuba hasn't had a paint job in a real long time. And, and, and there's something there that's like romantic and beautiful. But as we were saying in our conversation the other day, a, a, a lot of people from the outside might see it as beautiful. But it's kind of like this, well, you, I think you called it um, poverty tourism, where people romanticize the, the bleakness of others, but they don't have to actually live there to experience that. At the same time, it is beautiful because... Cuba, Cuban people are the glue. They bond together. They survive. They, they thrive. They're resilient. You know, and, you know, I just love it there. At the same time, it's one of those places that is constantly reminding you of, of, of how different it is and how close it is to what we're used to here in the United States. How there, some things work much better than here and how some of the little things that we have here can make life perhaps easier for people there. I don't know, it's complicated, but yeah, it, these it, walls, it, it's, it, it's about that. It, it's about all of these kind of intrinsic questions about um, life and, um, and, and, and a better quality of life or uh, the, 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 the theories and, practition or, and practices of what divides us. And these are walls. Walls are meant to shelter us, but walls are also used to divide us, you know? And so a lot of these remnants, these pieces that I made are re reminders of those things that block us, okay? But that's why I always have two sides to these and you're meant to walk around them and explore all sides. And uh, I recently showed um, a series of these here in New York at, uh, at the Beyond uh, the Street exhibition that Roger Gassman uh, and Chino put together. And, and that was really cool to see how that also had a, a, um, um, an audience that saw it very differently than like you would see it at the High Museum or, or, or SCAD or something sure. like that, you know? Again, these, these are your sculpture practice, but you're a painter first, right? And what's interesting outside of, of themes and uh, subject matter, let's just say. Uh, I, I pulled this quote by one of my favorite painters, Hans Hoffman, where he sa talks about painters. He says, painters must speak through paint, not through words. The whole world as we experience it visually comes to us through the mystic realm of color. Through a painting, we can see the whole world. Hans Hoffman. And the reason I use that quote um, as we start thinking about you as a painter, one of the greatest paintings you've done was at One World Trade Center. 
uh, this was an epic, epic undertaking. Yeah. Uh, I, I fully realized painting that took you quite some time. Let, let's let's talk about this project, how you arrived at this project. Um, yeah. And well, so there's a gentleman in New York. Um, his name is Asher Edelman. He's a curator. He's had his own museum in Switzerland. Um, he was one of the first to show Jean-Michel Basquiat in Europe and uh, incredible collector. He's just, he's a, we've become very good friends, but he was the first guy to reach out to me um, for this project. I was introduced to him by artist uh, Prun Nuri, who's a fantastic sculptor and dear friend. And um, it was sort of a secret competition to do um, a presentation to see who would get this project for the entrance of the World Trade Center, which for me, it's been a huge honor to just be a part of it because not only is it um, a symbol of um, New York, but it's also a, a, a place that celebrates resilience and strength because of the history of what happened at, at the World Trade Center during September 11. So it, it, it's, it's really sobering to be a part of something this big, you know, and to uh, have been trusted to do work in a place that you know, millions of people will get to walk through there and, and see the work. So that was very humbling at first. Uh, so humbling that I didn't even know what to make, you know? And I kept thinking about the city and how I wanted to write a love letter to New York. So this video that you guys are watching is titled exactly like the painting, One Union of the Senses. And the union of the senses is when all of your senses become one to the point of confusion, it's known as synesthesia. And so synesthesia for me had, uh, it became something that happened. It was an occurrence that happened while I was painting. I basically started like with a stream of consciousness of colors. And I started to imagine the broader landscape of New York from its people, the components of the neighborhoods that make New York, the languages, the backdrop of so many cultures that make New York. And, um, that is the world culture. If you think about it, people from every country in the planet live in New York and make this city, you know, what it is. And so it was really just an homage to the world, hence the World Trade Center, right? But um, it was also a meaning of union and unity that I wanted to show. So I wanted to uh, celebrate the spirit of, of, of humanity there. And so the film that my brother and I made together with our friend Max Goldman, um, was, you know, the twin of the painting. So it, it's for the Twin Towers. It's an homage to, to the twins. And um, you, you, you don't have it here, but it has beautiful sound. Uh, we composed all original music to it by our friends, uh, um, L. Michael's Affair, which is a, a, a brilliant um, New York yeah. um, group that makes like funk and, and experimental Latin sounds. and. Uh, they did such an incredible music for it that we actually showed the film for its first um, time ever at the Brooklyn Academy of Music um, with a live orchestra of about 30 musicians. That was just incredible. It was really something special to see in person. And um, we could send a link. I mean, maybe you could send the link out. This, is, um, this film is on Istanbul 74 out there on YouTube. So you guys could check it out. Um, but uh, it was a really, you know, big change in my life at this time because I had also, with my brother Ray, just finished construction on our new studio. Uh, at that time, it was 2015, which was also designed by Snohera, um, the architects that I mentioned that I had worked with before. This is an interesting part of the movie. Here, we did like a, we, we took like a, a plastic that was deep enough to fill it with water. And we, I hired dancers from the streets and I got them to do flips on this thing so we could get the reflection of the city. So we were doing all kinds of really experimental stuff on this film. Like, it was just really fun to work on. But yeah, it was like a love letter to New York. We were inside, we're, this is in the Bronx and we were like, you know, filming people having coffee at the, at the you know, Dominican spot. Um, you know, walls, the textures, you can't tell which one is a painting and, one, and which one is a wall outside, people going by. It's the life of the city, the, the, the breathing of the walls and the element of, you know, our, our skies, our transportation and, and, and our energy put into this kind of, 
you know, love letter that became a film and a painting at the same time. It's wonderful. I hope folks, uh, you, can you give us a title again so they can go online and search for it? Yeah, it's titled One Union of the Senses. And you can Google that. Um, uh, Istanbul 74 posted it. Um, I mean, I can send you the link and you, you can email it out through, through your, your website yes. uh, newsletter if you want later. Um, but yeah. So yeah, I, wanna, I hope I people wanna, can check it out. I, I, I want to come back to the act of painting. Uh, the challenge of painting something so big um, and uh, again, and uh, keeping, because it's a big piece, I've been in front of it a few times and that in itself uh, is a challenge to compose and uh, compose a big balanced painting uh, at this scale. Uh, you, here we see that you started it in your studio, uh, but I know that you ended up finishing it at on site. Yeah. Well, you know, my studio is all right. It's, it's got definitely a lot of space. It's about 18 feet high ceilings. But at the World Trade Center, the ceilings are 50 feet and there's so much natural light. And I always wanted to finish it there for various reasons, for the light and for the space, but also because I would have the opportunity to finish while the workers are still there, finishing like the the... the the uh, tiled walls, the lighting, security, you know, and I was able to work with all these um, incredible people from all the five boroughs, you know, and funny enough, they were the first ones to see the painting. And a lot of them were from the Bronx, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and they knew right away that it was about writing. They knew it was the writers, you know, and they could relate to it because they're New Yorkers. And they said, you know, they said things to me like, man, we're so glad that you did this painting here and that is art of the people for the people. So that, that was really nice to, to, to hear people say that because, you know, the thing about art in public that's important is, you know, not everybody in public that comes across a piece of art has an education on art history. You know what I mean? Like, so I like that my art can relate to all kinds of people, people that, you know, are just walking by on their way to work or, you know, people that did study art or that have like, you know, uh, an academic background. So for me, it's really about like bringing all that and gelling it together. And, and that really meant a lot. I mean, you could see through the film here, it's like the layers of all the people living in New York, going to work, going to school, you know, um, and doing exercise. Some kid did a random flip when we did like, you know, and it was important for me to bring dancing into the film because a lot of what I do with painting incorporates jumping off ladders, um, dancing and movement in a way that captures that energy of my youth as, as, a, as a dancer, but also captures the energy of the city and the urgency of painting. You know, I mean, my painting is definitely action-based um, and um, it's a reflection of not just me, but the multitudes of people. Yeah, it's it, one of the things that, that is so striking about it is how vivid and alive it is, how much energy uh, it has. Uh, it, it, it just brings a whole another life to the architecture. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it works seamlessly with its, its own environment. Did, let me ask you a question. In terms yeah. of the commission, when it was considered were people saying, wait, is this too much like graffiti? Did the graffiti word come up at all in this conversation? Not, not at all. I mean, you know, first of all, um, the commission, from what I remember, uh, it was not public. And it was, meaning it, it wasn't a competition made to the public. They were doing studio visits of all types of painters in New York. Um, it was a commission of the World Trade Center, the New York and New Jersey Port Authority and the Durst organization, which manages yeah. the building. So, so everyone, um, it was like a group of like 50 people making the decision. So you would, you know, they would do a studio visit, then 20 people would call again and do another studio visit. So it was a process uh, of, of, of a while. And, um, you know, no one really ever brought up anything about the name of the kind of, you know, but I never, you know, I also never hid the history of who I am because part of getting a commission like this is that they get to know you very well. 
And so they got to know me, they got to know my roots, how I started as a writer. But interesting that you bring it up because for me, you know, we had this conversation the other day and I've always been really like a stickler when it came to the word graffiti. I had a problem with it. Part of the reason I had a problem with it was first, when we were kids, we never called it that. We just called ourselves writers. But then it was reinforced when I met Phase Two in New York and Phase told me that to call what we do graffiti is like calling a comet a meteorite. And it stuck to me, you know? And so I would always just talk about my work in a, in a way that it was um, not pigeonholed into that or into anything really. I also didn't really try to claim that it was any kind of abstraction or abstract expressionism right. or, or really, um, I just talked about my work as something that was tied to history in many facets. And, um, but That's if somebody, if somebody wanted to talk about graffiti with me, I would talk about it. And I would always talk about those roots being very important to me. I, right. And, 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 you know, it's, it, it is, a, a, it, it's funny because as radical as the painting looks, it's not that depart, that far departed from its origins. Um, and, you know, we spoke about Wilfredo Lam and I, I picked up this quote for this next section with regard to life, modern painting is a revolutionary activity. We need it in order to transform the world into a more humane place where mankind can live in liberty. We must accept things with passion. It means that we must live imaginatively, quote unquote, Wilfredo Lam, which, brings us, which brings us to Cuba, right? Yeah. And, and how we, a place of revolution, a, a, a place that's trying to reimagine itself uh, with, again, with really difficult constraints. Uh, but you went out there with JR and you started the project Wrinkles, mm -hmm. of the, Wrinkles in the City. Wrinkles uh, of the City, yeah. So, so JR, um, I gotta give him so much credit. He had done Wrinkles of the City in Shanghai and Cartagena, Spain. Um, and we were invited to partake in the um, Havana Biennial in 2012. So this predates the opening of Obama and, and, uh, and, 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 and Cuba having conversations. And um, my brother said to JR and I, yo, you guys should do a trade, like make some work for each other. And in that conversation, JR and I just ended up saying, why don't we collaborate in Cuba? And we took the project to Cuba. And we landed there, we started interviewing people right off the airplane. I mean, we were carrying camera equipment, sound equipment, recording all types of cameras, you know. I mean, like we kind of had some permission, but not yet. We weren't supposed to get started yet. So we were all over and we, the police, immigration police, all kinds of people were like asking us what we we're doing with all this camera equipment. They took my brother's microphone away because they thought it was like some kind of espionage thing or whatever. And, but what we got is all this incredible footage and we made a film. You guys can also see this film. It's titled Wrinkles of the City, Havana, Cuba. Uh, and we documented the lives of elderly folks, um, pretty much above the ages of 80, 85 to 100. We had someone that was 106 years old in the film and we documented their lives uh, and asked them questions, interviewed them for the purpose of making 12 murals, really gigantic murals all over Havana. Um, and there, I mean, we were painting under the rain Sometimes it was like blazing hot and we were like using like crazy broken old school um, uh, uh, lifts, you know, we, we like hired out a lift from the electric company one day. So I think my brother just posted the film with the link. You guys could see the link uh, and you can see the size of some, of some of the murals that we were working on. And it was just super interesting because since the time that we did this mural, okay, um, in Cuba, you don't see murals or projects of this magnitude, right? No, well, you, you see saw... revolutionary. Yeah, you exactly. Revolu like, like, for example, you see like these kind of uh, political propaganda, revolutionary images of Che Guevara, sometimes of other, um, you know, um, revolutionaries. And, uh, and so when we started doing our murals and they were so big and they were happening quite fast because we came really prepared, um, sometimes they just didn't know what we were doing. The public themselves thought we were 
working with the government or doing some kind of revolutionary tactic or something. And, you know, it was really nice because at one point we'll just say, look, who does that look like to you? Like, you know, this person on the wall. And, you know, they'd be confused and we'll say, look, it's, you know, Jose from down the block and Alicia. And they were like neighbors and they were each very important in their own right. But we selected them randomly, particularly because of the wrinkles on their face. We wanted to photographically match the wrinkles of their face to the falling, decrepit buildings of Havana uh, and, and matched, you know, some of these um, roots elegantly onto the surfaces and then incorporate the color from the existing wall onto the, onto the uh, mural. We made studies like the canvas that you see here on the left and the mural that you see on the, on the right. So we made studies to get the colors right. And uh, we had exhibitions based on those studies as well. And it was just a pleasure to work with JR. I mean, you guys have seen his um, career, his work just gone, you know, all over the world. And he's just doing such humanitarian, incredible work. So for me, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be able to work with him and call him a, a brother, really. He's, he's like family to us. Um, here you see this uh, mural. This woman was a dancer. We didn't know she was a known dancer. We just met her on the street. And she allowed us to take her photograph and do this mural of her. And over the years, we would bring back some of these folks to um, the murals. And, you know, it's Cuba, so it's raining, there's storms, hurricanes, and some of the murals would fall apart, you know, in two, three, four, five years, they, they stopped to, to exist. Uh, but we documented the, pos the process of how they also ceased to exist. And it was just a I have some of those pictures I'll send you one day, it, it's, but, a, it's a beautiful project. And one of the things I like is um, how, how dignified uh, these older folks are. Yeah. There, there's something so beautiful about um, how they're photographed, but also how you embellish around them. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, this woman is striking to me. She's incredible. So she, the, the previous woman, she didn't want her photo taken at first. And then we were just walking down the street, talking to other people. And um, a, a few minutes had gone by and we turned around and she was there now wearing some jewelry, a little makeup, uh, earrings. <laughs> and so, you know, her pride was starting to, to come out. And yes, you could see the dignity in, in her. And uh, we became friends with all of them. I mean, we've you know, gone back to visit a lot of them. Some of them were sadly old enough that now they have passed away, but just the sweetest and cutest and just loveliest people that we were able to have the privilege to paint and, 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 and make uh, these murals of them. And again, you know, the backdrop uh, for me is so reminiscent of, of uh, New York through the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and this is a good point of transition for us to bring you back home. Uh, yeah. And as the world burned and crumbled around us, we took arms with spray paint and markers in order to create a new reality. And yeah, I love I, that quote, man. That's fantastic. I've seen, I've I, seen this of you before. I, I think of, of that for this image, right? We were talking about um, how society structures will break down and wear and, 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 and grow old around us. But, you know, people are resilient. And yeah. we, we as a culture, we was very resilient in making something from nothing. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, that gave birth to the hip hop culture. Yeah, I mean, look, huge, huge shout out to Henry Chalfant, the previous photograph, and these are Henry Chalfant and to Suso, 33 from Madrid, I see you in there. Um, Henry Chalfant just had the exhibition at the Bronx Museum previous yes. to me. And um, when I was planning my show, rest in peace uh, to Holly Block, who was the director who gave me the show with Manon Sloan, the curator, we still didn't know that Henry was gonna have the show there. And I was planning moving forward and I thought about the show titling it, It's Yours uh, because of the song by Tila Rock because I wanted to make a show about community. It was the roots of the Bronx that gave me the art form that has largely contributed to who I am as a person and an artist. And being in the Bronx, oh, that's me back in uh, Miami uh, breakdancing. I had a, yo, Seam was there, Dash, Junior. So 
I was also b-boying in those days. So the exhibition was highly influenced by the Bronx and those days of New York. Um, obviously, all New York City, Brooklyn, Uptown, Manhattan, Harlem, downtown, Staten Island. There were writers and b-boys everywhere that really influenced us in Miami. And uh, so back to the Bronx and doing that exhibition, it was a way to not only pay homage to the roots of who we are as artists and creators, but it was also, like you said, commenting on the social construct of what was surrounding us and what allowed us to make art in, in those kind of um, places. I mean, it was in New York, but it wasn't exclusive to New York that art was coming out of violent places with a lot of really uh, difficult situations. And so the show is about community. It was about coming together, but it was also about highlighting um, ideas of ownership. So, oh, my bad. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I, no, mean, no, I wanted to, I, yeah. you're right about that. And I, what I wanted to share with, with everyone was the video that was produced. Um, it, it's beautiful, it's exciting. And you and I kind of lamented a little bit about this being such a great New York moment and where people could actually hug each other and kiss each other and celebrate you, you know? And dance um, together and, and, and we have food. We had the ghetto gastro brothers from the Bronx do all culinary experience from food made from, you know, sources around the Bronx to celebrate not only painting and music and dancing, but also food. So there was a lot of sharing that night. It was yeah, really about so bringing everybody together. Let's, let's give people a sample. Yeah, bust it. Oh, I was fresh. I was fresh. Wow. What a yeah. powerful... Yeah, it was a great night, man. What a, what a powerful memory of, of uh, yeah, of a time... Yeah, uh, pre-pandemic. It was yeah. just before, it was a month before the pandemic, and no one could really uh, imagine or predict that we'd be like, you know, where we are now. No. And so let's talk about the paintings. You know, thematically, you you... You know, these all have very specific names. Uh, this particular painting, tell me more about this painting. So, you know, each each painting has something to do with um, the ideas of redlining and what, and what caused, um, you know, a lot of the division in places like the Bronx and Brooklyn and even parts of different cities around the United States. Um, but in, in this show, I decided to title paintings with lyrics that corresponded from the song It's Yours by Tila Rock. Um, and so this one is uh, uh, illustrating the commentating, which is, you know, uh, in the song, it's commentating, illustrating, description, giving. And so yeah. a lot of the ways that I understood his song um, was kind of what started to shape my mind. As, imagine, I was like 11 or 12 years old when I heard It's Yours. It started to shape my mind because hip hop music will become my teachers, you know? So from Tila Rock to KRS-One, you know, an endless list of, of rappers, you know, Rakim, rappers from my era, you know, like Big Daddy Kane, all those lyricists became my teachers. So a lot of the uh, experiences from those songs would end up as titles to a lot of the work in, in this exhibition, you know? And, uh, and so like this one, this is one titled, um, Writer's Bench, 149th Street in the Bronx. And I was telling you earlier, this painting reminds me of you, Mayor 139. It reminds me of Hayes. 
and uh, um, and case two and scheme and you know that scene in Style Wars where everybody's at the writer's bench and talking and Min is there and you know never forgive action and all those things that were happening and that lingo of who we are as writers the way that we communicate when we're around each other it's like it changes you know like you and I can go out and talk to about anybody about anything but when we're just writers in the room it's just something else right. And so it was a way to incubate that in a painting. How do you translate something from memory into painting? And that's a lot of what's going on in this show. And, and so what are you doing now during Corona? What, 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 what's, your, what's, what's your life now? I mean, you had yeah. this big, wonderful gathering mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's rather sobering looking at that video as to where we are now, but we are here now and what are you doing today? Well, so I've been able to go into the studio and start new work because the show was so recent. Um, the studio was empty and I started from scratch. So these are some of the new works in progress. Um, you can see I'm working on something. These are projects that I haven't really um, started to talk about publicly, but I'll, you know, uh, share that more down the road. But some of the things that I've been doing related to my new paintings is... Um, teaching. I've been spending a lot of time uh, as a mentor with the National Young Arts Foundation uh, and working with a cohort of young artists over Zoom. So I've been teaching over Zoom and spending time at the studio at the same time. Uh, I've been working on two projects that are made, uh, that are coming out soon to raise money for hospitals here in Brooklyn uh, and for educational programs as well here in New York. Um, I've also been working with my old college with Savannah College of Art and Design and I've been um, uh, also teaching with the students and um, now working on a new project uh, as a judge for a competition that they're having. So I'm staying active. I'm staying in touch with people. Uh, I'm seeing a lot more of my family, which has really been great. And, um, you know, I think as an artist, I've been really privileged that even before the pandemic, all I ever did was go from home to the studio. So I'm still just doing the same thing, but with a lot on my mind and I'm experimenting and uh, thinking about a lot of new ideas of things that I wanna do. Uh, I guess the only difference is that um, I'm not traveling. Right now, um, projects that, were on, uh, that are on hold, uh, I would have been in London with Hank Willis Thomas, who's one of my favorite contemporary artists based here in New York. And Hank and I were doing tremendous. Hank is an amazing work. artist. Yeah, yeah, he's great. We're still doing this project when we have the, the opportunity to open things up again. But it's a huge sculpture project in London that we're going to collaborate on together. So we're doing that. Um, there's the Wide Awakes projects, which is uh, a, a sort of Wide Awakes is like this New York, uh, you, you know, universal group of of, of, of artists um, that uh, really spreading the word to, to, of information to get everybody united on so many fronts. And so, you know, just staying active, staying in touch with the community. It, it's, yeah, it sounds like everything, this has kind of galvanized the community of art, uh, whereas we were so busy with the business of art, right? Everybody was kind of really focused on the business of art, of, of being in shows or exhibitions. Um, and um, this is kind of uh, something that has kind of, from what I understand, uh, brought artists together to advocate for one another and their ideas. And not yeah. just for them, for other younger people who are interested in pursuing yeah. these arts. We're, yeah. of that, we're of that age that we now can pay it forward, right? Yeah, you know, and, and like I was saying earlier, like just the nature of the way our structure as writers has always been, there's always, we've always had this mentorship system because there was always an older writer teaching right. a younger writer and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that system has always been part of who we are. Um, but you're right that now it's, it's time to really focus and pay it forward even more without any excuses. And, you know, I, I keep thinking about something that um, uh, was said to me by my friend Sol the other day. It's like artists, right now we can't afford not to get involved. Artists yeah. can't stay quiet. We have to, um, you know, make work related to what's happening in the world and be engaged and be political and say something about all the inequities that are happening and really just, you know, stay together and, and show unity uh, because there's a lot of struggle out there. And so I think we come from a place that has always been on the fringes. Um, some of us had 
I mean, thank God, a lot of us have had um, breakthroughs through our art that we can communicate to a broader and larger spectrum of people. But that being said, we are from the roots. Uh, we, we are people that um, care about where we come from. And so we're not gonna just separate from that. And, you know, I, I think it's important to always bring people with us where, wherever it is we're going and to just keep spreading love, you know, not to sound cliche, but that's what it is. Yeah, no, it's not that, but we're, and interestingly enough, as a, as a collective, we're so legacy minded uh, for such a young group of people. Um, that said, Jose, I want to pause for yeah. a second and take some questions yeah. uh, from our guests out there, because I know you guys have been wanting, uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes. So I, I saw some questions up in here and I want to grab some. And if I can't get to one, does anyone have one right up off the top? But well, we have a lot of good friends in here. So I'm I see everybody. See Crash is in there. Wow. Oh, Gemios are Champ here. Champ Magazine. Oh, Gemios has been in the house. Love you guys, Brazil. Yeah. Oh, my brother Ray skiing the place to be. Yeah, Venster and Benny in Miami. What's up? I see everybody's up, up in there. Chino's in the house. All right, Nicer. guys. Uh, yeah, they've been commenting but not giving us any questions. So if you guys uh -huh. uh, give oh. us some questions, uh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, here you go. Has the show been extended in the Bronx? Oh, good question. So the show right now has been extended until January, hoping that they can reopen sometime in September. So September 9th is right now the date that's marked as like a reopening. And uh, of course, they're seeing to see what happens here in New York with um, what's allowed, you know. Uh, but it has been extended till January. Yeah. It is. I, I have to say, uh, you know, when Henry's show was announced and then your show was announced, I was, I, I was overwhelmed because uh, I'm from the Bronx. I've always wanted to see, look, the Bronx Museum has always done great shows that just fall under the radar. And these two shows back to back were so spectacular and important for them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, of course, you know, Corona hit during your show, but a lot of people got to see, you got good acclaim for it, which is important. And that the community has access to it. That's what's really important, right? Thank you, man. It means a lot to me coming they, from you. I always looked up to you as an artist, as a friend. You yeah. know, as a Miami cat, a lot of people know moving to New York and, 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 and meeting writers, it wasn't easy at first, but you always gave me love from the beginning. And Futura, Lee, Stash, uh, yeah. the, the list is endless. How many great um, artists I got to become friends with. You, you got a question from another artist, Crime79. Our, oh, Brooklyn in the house. Crime, Brooklyn's yeah. In the house. He asked, when did you change from Ease to Jose Parla? Well, so I basically never changed. I'm still Ease and I'm still Jose Parla. Uh, so, but to, to be accurate with you about that is, um, it was probably, it was 1998 that my father died. And my father is the original Jose Parla. He's the OG. And so I, I basically just, started signing my paintings, Jose Parla, in homage to him. Uh, but I never stopped being eased, you know. I still painted after that. I still kept books, you know. I, a lot of my paintings, if you look really closely, they got a lot of ease tags in them. And I still hang out with people that yeah. call me ease, you know. So I'm, I'm yeah. you know, that's who I am. I, I just, you know, um, never changed. I never evolved. I just expanded, you know. You got a question from Nat. He says, you Yo, guys Nat. are restoring my faith in, in art uh, and for humanity. What, what do I think I can do to engage and to contribute? Um, that's kind of an obscure question. Well, uh, you know, the way yourself, I understood that question right? is, and all I could say is like, remain true to yourself and true to what you love. And if you are happy with yourself, then you're gonna be able to show that to others. Uh, Futura asks, what Yo. is your favorite Cuban food? <laughs> well, I would say picadillo, okay? You got little, but you know, I'm the kind of person, I got the white rice on the side, the picadillo on the, on, on the other side, <laughs> with totone, a little, a little uh, you know, garlic and a salad. I'm simple, man. Picadillo with some little, um, you know, aceitunas on the side, I'm good to go. <laughs> likes, likes one ask. Do you think viewers need to have a prior knowledge of graffiti style writing to appreciate the evolution of your work? 
Um, yes and no. I don't think so. I've, you know, if I tell you that I've had people from all over the world, different um, age groups, different backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds, and they speak different languages, appreciate my work. Some not have any idea about everything we just talked about. They just see the work, they like the work, they appreciate something. And that goes to show you the power of art. Art crosses boundaries of language. It's similar to music in that way, um, and especially abstract art. Uh, but the answer to that, I'd probably say is no. Yeah, because you know what? The one, the one common thing in all of us is the, the movement of our hands, right? The writing, penmanship. Um, and that's embedded in your work. You know, that itself anchors you to the work. Uh, yeah. To, to build a relationship with the work. 100%. Uh, another question here uh, from All Natural 777. What advice can you give the up and coming graffiti artists trying to break through into the gallery art scene? Well, first of all, if, if that's what you want to make, if that's why you want to make art, you got to re examine why you want to make art. Because um, I have, there's conflicting situation we would just asked. Uh, if you want to be a graffiti artist just to get it or to, to get into the gallery scene, first you have to be true to who you are, regardless of the gallery. You have to true to that you have to be true to that work and true to that art first and foremost and and and, and have such expansion within yourself to create something so unique that no galleries matter because without the galleries you're still gonna make art. And that's more important than anything else. Um, and then you'll figure out the rest because your work will be strong and then that's it, you know? I saw another question here that I thought was interesting. Somebody said, do you believe it's important for new generation writers to study the culture and pay homage to the pioneers of this art movement? I think that if you're a writer, by, by respecting your, um, you know, elder writers, that's, that's a given. You have to do that. Yeah. Because if you don't respect all the writers, you probably won't respect yourself. It's just that that goes for all life. Um, but you don't have to pay homage. I mean, you can study them. It's good to know. I think all history, study history, be part of um, history by making something strong. I yeah. see another question. I see some. So, sorry, you go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say to trail that is just, you know, by default, by the, by the act itself, whether you're conscious of it or not, you are paying homage, right? Because you, were, you inherited something important um, that's not just from us. Again, this was so, what's so great about the presentation. Yeah. You, you inherited humanity, the story of humanity, of, of human expression. And yeah. that, that goes way back uh, to the, the, the oyster shell yeah. and, and the cave paintings. Yeah. Um, and so whether you're conscious of it or not, you're part of a lineage of, uh, of this expressionistic act. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also, you know, it's important to say that I didn't think of my art only as inside the bubble of being a writer and graffiti. Um, I didn't limit it to that. I was proud of that, which is a difference. And I kept that engaging element visually in my work, um, but it wasn't the only capsule uh, or it wasn't the only form encapsulating my interests. You know, I wanted to bring the form of writers into yeah, the and, visual landscape of the world, you, you know. Right, and you, and you did it at a good time because it, it, you weren't facing the resistance that some of us early writers had within the culture that felt very differently once you start you know, uh, applying different theories and practices into your work, whether it was modernism in my case, or in Futura with abstraction, Crash with pop art, you know, yeah. that, that those things, um, you, you know, it's really interesting. You have to allow yourself to bring these ideas forward in your work yeah. uh, and to, in order to move it, you know, move it ahead yeah. um, and, and not, you know, listen to the naysayers and not uh, be pigeonholed, so to speak. Yeah, no, 100%. Never be pigeonholed, you know? Never be pigeonholed. Always, like, kind of uh, break down barriers of definition. And, you know, why have a label when you could just be free or try to be free, you know? 
It's, don't you find it interesting now that uh, because of the success and sometimes the failure of graffiti and street art that it is, you can actually reclaim the word graffiti in your, in your story without the kind of um, apprehension. Because I know I had apprehension at one point about it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, you know, the, the thing is, is that like any, any um, marker or label I've always had trouble with. But like the other day when I was listening to you speak with Henry Chalfon and you asked him about the label of the word graffiti, you know, he, he answered in a way that was really uh, meticulous. He was, he's a student of classical Greek. Mm -hmm. And gr the word graffiti call, comes from graphene, which means to write, okay? So in fact, that's what we do, we write, but that's not all we do. And if, that, if, if I'm a writer by nature of what that means to go out and, and go bombing and do trains and, and rooftops and do burners, then I'm no longer just a writer because I have a studio practice now for over 25 years. Um, I'm experimenting with filmmaking, uh, photography, sculpture, collaborations. So I can't be intelligent and at the same time accept to be put into a box of any definition. However, you're right. I can claim the word graffiti, reclaim it, spin it, change it, give it my own meaning if I want to, or at the same time I could say no. I, I don't want to use that word. It, it's, it's really, you know, up to the individual. I think that there's a lot of young people out there that haven't had the experiences that you and I had in order to understand this really broad picture of what it is. And sometimes when, you know, someone introduces me as an artist, I don't even want to be introduced as an artist, let alone do I want to be introduced as a graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be introduced, you know, in that way because people start to have connotations of what that, Absolutely. means to them and you know in popular culture right um graffiti is not what it used to be back in the days so somebody might say oh you know you're a graffiti artist to that person it might mean that you paint sneakers or that you do baseball caps or that right. you do little robots i don't know what that means to that person anymore because the meanings have changed morphed warped uh it's 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 a mess okay <laughs> but but what you guys have done, though, I want to, because I know we have little time. We have a, we I have a minute. I want to say that what you have done in Miami with the Museum of Graffiti is important because you have given a home to the foundations of style writing. Exactly. Okay. And you cannot just call it the Museum of Style Writing because some people would be just like, what the hell are these guys talking about? It would be so, so obscure. So you're opening a door and you're allowing people to come in to learn about something that was underground. Really, it was underground. Oh, absolutely. And you're teaching, so that's really fantastic. Well, I mean, the importance of, and I think the, the, the point we make is, is that, you know, don't be mistaken by the word graffiti. As you come in, one of the things we talk about is style writing. It comes from the hand, it comes from children. Um, and it's a big story. And we open our doors uh, tomorrow, we're limited. So, you know, people come, um, check us out online um, and uh, reach out join our emailing list for our program we're about to sign off in about 30 seconds jose so again i want to uh, i want to answer one last question so i see heck he's an old writer from miami you got 20 and, seconds uh, yeah yo sar rest in peace we did a beautiful outlaw art piece for him in fort green brooklyn lots of love to everybody thank love. you for being here with us Tomorrow, I will have Mast online, so that'll be a greater conversation as well. Jose, I love you. Thank you so much. Love you too. And uh, we appreciate you. Thank you, everybody.